Hello, welcome to Aviation 101 with Laura. Uh, in response to a, a lot of requests about an interview, another interview with the aircraft dispatcher and an interesting topic that I have never covered, we are going to talk today about re-dispatch and re-release flight plans with one of the alumni who I actually helped train for aircraft dispatch, and that is Barrick Dalton. And Barrick works for a rather large company doing a lot of long haul international dispatch. So when I decided I wanted to do this topic, I reached out to him because I knew he would know about this. And sure enough, I was right. You say you did that. You do that a lot, right, Barrick? So, okay. And so before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this video is Zero Eight Left. And you can see my shirt today. I love this one. It says fly the airplane, do not hurry. Zero eight left. This is uh, good advice actually from a DC-10 old manual. Uh, I also have got in the background a really cool diagram of DFW, one of my favorite airports, customized with the color. And I got my special runway socks on, which are really cool because you can't really see. There you go. One says eight right and one says eight left. So I got to make sure I put them on the right feet when I put them on in the morning. So zero eight left is kind enough to sponsor this video and use code zero eight Laura for 20% off your whole order. Okay, so Barrick, we are going to talk about what is re-clear and what is re-dispatch. And so when we talk about that, and the reason I brought you on on the channel is to talk about how we can use re-release and re-dispatch. Now, re-release would apply to flight follower type of operation. Re-dispatch is if we've got dispatchers. So that's just a term. You'll see it on all the slides, but it's it's basically interchangeable for the purposes of this video. Um, when we operate under 121 flag or supplemental rules, if your company has a specific op spec, I know for sure it's op spec B44, but I'm not going to say that there's no other op specs having to do with this because I think you told me there are, right, Barrick? Or we think there are. Yeah, there are different uh, fuel op specs that um, you can have, and this happens to be one uh, one of them that's, uh, that we use. Okay. Yeah, and so again, this is advice of a general nature. I, if you're working at a company, you're going to have to know your own company's procedures. But my goal with this one is to just kind of shed a little bit light on some of our goals with re-release and re-dispatch. What we want to do, and we're going to get into the technicalities of fuel loading in a second, but we want to increase our payload and hopefully reduce the amount of fuel needed for the operation and thereby increase our payload and thereby increase the efficiency with which we operate. Okay, so when we're talking about re-release, I think it's helpful if we start with a quick review of the fuel requirements. I do have another video about this, so you guys can check that out, but uh, with a flag type of flight, we have to have the fuel from the departure to the destination and we need fuel to go to the alternate, and we need our 30 minutes of holding, and then we need 10% reserve, which sometimes some people call contingency fuel, okay? So, Barrick, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Of those four buckets of fuel, I mean, really, what's the only thing that we can cut by using re-release? Oh, uh, yeah, really the only thing we can use is that 10% in route reserves. Right. For the re-release. Yeah, exactly. So, and how can we do that is basically by the only way to do it is shorten the number of minutes that we're applying the 10% yep. to. Yeah. So, um, we're going to talk here about the optimum point to do that at. And then basically, once you have an optimum point for re release, then we can free up some of that fuel to be utilized and instead use it for payload. And so the re-release or re-dispatch point is the point on the route of flight where the di decision to divert or continue flying is made. And uh, Barrick, you were telling me, where is that optimum distance again? It was 
89%? Yeah, for, for us, we look at 89% downrange. And our flight planning system that we have, we, uh, we allow it to choose where we want, you know, where we, the cities we want. And it'll typically pick along the route 89%. But you still have to okay. watch it and see and make watch your fuels and make sure it still gives you the optimal uh, amount of fuel. Okay, so at basically, like I was saying, there's a long flight, long haul flight. Eighty nine percent of the way is where you want your redispatch or re release point to generally be. Yes. Yep. Uh, again, you'll see my picture behind me of DFW in our break room here at work. We actually have about I don't know twelve or fourteen of these various airports customized to the school where I work colors all on the wall of airports that are special to us and it makes an awesome display one thing I love about zero eight left is that they will do custom custom like customization for you and they will send you proofs and they are awesome to work with small business feel but very professional products we've been very happy with everything we've got from them so when you make your order Go check it out and use code 08LAURA to get 20% off on your order. So check them out. All right, so let's do a comparison. I just pulled up like a flight going to Miami, okay? And if we're flying, say, from Seattle all the way to Miami, that is approximately, I looked it up on FlightAware, it's approximately a six-hour flight. That would be under domestic rules because it's Seattle to Miami. It's all within the 48 contiguous states. And for domestic under part 121, we need enough fuel to get us from the departure to the destination, plus any alternate, and then 45 minutes. Okay, so that's the basic gist of the domestic rules. Now I looked at another flight going into Miami. Uh, this one coming up from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And that is approximately eight hour flight. Looked it up on FlightAware. But that is now a flag type of operation. And because it's a flag operation, like I said before, we need enough fuel to do from our departure airport to the destination. So it's Miami for my example here. And then we need 30 minutes of holding at Miami. And then we need however much to go to any alternates and then we also need 10 percent of that total in route time so i did the math that's another 48 minutes so we have like 48 minutes of 10 percent reserve plus the 30 minute holding that's 78 minutes of reserve coming into miami now both flights could choose the same airport barrick what do you what do you typically use in miami alternate alternate yeah, typically Fort Lauderdale, uh, okay. West Palm. Those are what we're looking at. Too. So you put on enough fuel to go to Fort Lauderdale. But like both of these flights are coming to the same exact airport. One has a 45 minute reserve because it came from Seattle. The other came from Sao Paulo. And so it's got 78 minute reserve. Both have the same exact alternate. And, and so really it raises the question of why? I mean, they're both pretty long flights. They're both headed into the United States, same airport. Why? And so that is where some operators choose to do redispatch or re release. Um, and so using redispatch or re release, uh, if you release the flight, you would send it to a closer destination initially. And prior to getting to that destination, the dispatcher has to do a bunch of checking and relay information to the pilot. And then if all that's acceptable, then the dispatcher gives another release to go farther, essentially. So um, now that frees up our 10% reserve just to that last little bit. So, uh, Barrick, I'm going to put you on the spot now. because I'm going to shut up. Uh, give us some example, like you can use hypothetical airports or ones that you want to use, whatever. But give me like a hypothetical example of how this goes. Give me some airports. Okay, so a lot of airports you're going to see this used on. Um, for my operation I'm in, a lot out of Asia to the United States, North America. Uh, it's very, especially there's so much freight that 
there's a surplus coming in and there's not a lot going over. So you want to maximize as much as you can get on that aircraft. And so this we use reserves a lot because you're looking on some of those 12 hours flight, you know, 10 percent of that. That's, you know, a lot of that's almost an extra hour at least, uh, not more of uh, fuel. Uh, we also like using it um, coming in from Europe into the U.S. And even sometimes between international city pairs, whenever you're going over areas that are, uh, say, dicier, or maybe there's wars or conflicts going on, sometimes you choose to leave that fuel on board instead of redispatching. But typically, a lot of coming into the U.S. is where we use it the most. Okay. Can you give me an example, maybe, of like something where, tell me like what airport you would redispatch to, and then like where is your ultimate destination? Yeah, so uh, want to be like Hong Kong. So Hong Kong coming in, and typically if we're going into, uh, let's say Nashville. Okay, then roughly ninety percent downrange for that. We like using uh, Denver, Colorado Springs. Okay, That's typical coming over. Um, okay, if you're coming really far north. You may use something like uh, Calgary or uh, Great Falls. Uh, it, it's very, it's dependent on the route, but okay. where you're going to be at in times, but that's typical where we'd redispatch at. So you're, you're picking something or your computer, I mean, but you're approving it as the dispatcher. Yep. You, you're, you're routing over some airport already. And then at around 89% of the way, that's where your flight in is initially planned to, right? And yes. then once you get to the redispatch point, which is what, like, like two hours before that point. So if you said, you're going to Nashville, but it's Denver, so that's your first point. Uh, so two hours before Denver is when you're talking to the crew and checking everything. Yes, yes. Typically, okay. the the crew we do it different ways. Typically, the crew already knows, and so they're reaching out to us but right right at the two hour marks, and they're giving us the fuel what they're going to have at the redispatch point, and then we run an analysis, uh, check the winds again, check the weather, check notams, and uh, then once we've checked all that and we make sure that we at least have what the uh, min required fuel is. Um, and then if we have above that, we agree it's safe to continue. Uh, OK, that's when we start a process. Then you're going to redispatch the plane, the flight's crew and say, OK, from my perspective, everything's good. Just keep coming into Nashville, right? Mm -hmm. OK, yep. and then what that does is now I don't know how, how I don't know about how far it is from Denver to Nashville, but now you only need 10% of the duration between Denver and Nashville, and you've now freed up a tremendous amount of fuel because it was 10% of I don't know how long it is Hong Kong <laughs> long flight, long but flight, you've yeah. now freed it up, right? So now you can now you, that's why you could carry more payload to begin with leaving Hong Kong. Yes, because you're just using that reserve for the second leg of the flight, and that will cut. That covers most of it. You'll still need a little more, um, mm -hmm. obviously. But yeah, that's the reserves help cover that, and that's the difference of you know that could be ten thousand pounds. That could be, you know, fifteen thousand pounds. Because of operational control, both you and the crew have to agree to continue this this operation, um, and also the crew knows that Denver is the first plan like if you can't go all the way i mean clearly and i would what do you say like 95 or more percent of the time you're able to continue all the way to where you want to go yes i would say there's very few times that uh i've heard of or seen actually stopping short typically right. if it i mean sometimes you'll have pop-up thunderstorms in the southeast and mm -hmm. they're bad but typically typically they've gotten they've it's been planned and the weather you know but has been they saw it in advance and were able to put contingency but there are times that that's what you have to do but that yeah. that's the risk you take but being able to carry extra payload or fly further right the companies deem it worth the chance so. okay so most of the time yeah you're getting there now yeah i want to i want to just mention something else about it all for our example uh on your flight plan as I'm correct, you label Denver in the example we gave. Is that your initial destination? I mean, when where I worked, that was what like we called it. Yes. Yeah, so we we have ours. It's it'd be the first. So that Hong Kong to Denver, 
-hmm. it shows your burns and then it shows on the bottom part the burns for the whole flight or like after okay yeah your your final so you, it's like, yeah you see yeah. the fuel all the way okay right the other thing i wanted to also just point out if the flight crew cannot continue how far they want to go like with the two hour point two hour before Denver and you're like, well, they say we don't have enough fuel on board or something happens with, with like you say, thunderstorms, whatever. So they decide to land at the initial destination. In this example, Denver, they have to change. They have to get a new clearance with ATC because ATC is unaware of this whole operation. Yeah, ATC is aware of your flight, <laughs> but mm -hmm. they think it's going all the way to Nashville. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so they'd have to get another clearance and it'd be really it'd be another flight plan essentially for the crew right so interestingly also like i say atc is completely unaware of this as are any passengers <laughs> so um i know some operators do this with passenger carrying <laughs> operations um and so sometimes you might have to actually land short and get fuel again passengers are unaware of this but it allows the carrier to hopefully increase their payload and their efficiency of operation but in a safe way because we have a plan plus we have a check-in point at which point we're making sure the safety checks and then basically freeing up fuel to now have a shorter amount of that 10 percent flag required uh, contingency fuel so I just wanted to run over, uh, if you can give us some quick tips, like from dispatch perspective regarding re-release, that would be awesome. Really watching the weather, uh, I would say I would never, you know, if you have to have 2000 foot ceilings, I would not re-dispatch no alternate with 2500 broken, <laughs> you know. It's oh, okay. That you use. Yeah. It's, You'd it's, like it, to have a little bit better weather. Yeah, so and it depends. Maybe adding a short alternate is still good, and mm -hmm. your the fuel's still better. But sometimes, depending where you're at, um, it may not be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you were telling me before. Also, you have to be careful with some countries not allowing this. Yes, that that is a big thing uh, for the operation I'm in. There's certain countries that if you Redispatch, and even if the flight is under six hours, which internationally you don't need an alternate, mm -hmm. they still require an alternate regardless. Okay. So yeah, at that point, the alternate may be the big factor where you're at. And so, if that's the case, then it's like, well, if we're gonna have to add an alternate anyway, we'll use another fuel reserve instead, like the B43 or something, it, just because it's just adding. It's not a not, not that release is a risk, but it's just adding one more thing. And especially if you're handing off seven flights, eight of these long haul flights to another dispatcher and they're building flights, that's more steps that they're looking at. So you try to who you're relieving and what the rules are and just. Don't. OK, be, yeah. Be aware of your dispatcher workload for your. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Always safety first. We want to we want to save and, and serve the crews. Well, yes, that we're working with. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and again, one other quick shout out to this video sponsor, Zero Eight Left. Again, um, hope you guys like my shirt. I love this one. Fly the airplane. Do not hurry. Always good advice. Um, maybe we should have one that says dispatch the airplane. Do not hurry or dispatch the airplanes and do not hurry. Do your job well. Um, thanks, guys, for watching and hope you have an awesome day.